So I'm Louise Popple, and this is my colleague, Magdalena Baruka. And as Roland says, we're going to talk to you about uh, recent bad faith cases, um, focusing on Skykick and Monopoly, but also t pointing out some other recent interesting cases that you might want to know about. So, just by way of reminder, um, a trademark registration can be declared invalid if the application was made in, in bad faith, and it's the time the application was filed that we're looking at was the bad faith at that point. Um, in the UK, an application can also be opposed on this ground, um, but the same isn't true for EU trademarks. So if you want to uh, argue bad faith for an EU trademark, you have to wait till that's registered and then uh, put in an application for invalidity. Um, the, uh, there's no guidance in the legislation on what bad faith is, um, so that has really grown up around the case law. And each case very much decided on its own facts. Um, but most cases, I think it's fair to say in the past, have involved the situation where company A is trying to take or misappropriate uh, party B's trademark, and that's this kind of traditional bad faith kind of scenario. Um, but recently, with Skykick and Monopoly, we've seen an attempt to try to apply bad faith to slightly different scenarios to that, and that's why they've garnered a lot of interest. So let's look at Skykick first. So the case arose out of a dispute between Sky, the uh, well-known broadcaster and entertainment company. Um, Sky um, has a number of Sky trademark registrations, as you, as you would expect, and the kind of key ones in terms of this dispute were its registrations um, in class C's 9 and 38. So in 9, it got computer software, um, data storage, and then 38, uh, electronic mail services, and so on. Interestingly, um, Sky also has, uh, its registrations also cover some items that you wouldn't expect Sky to have an interest in. So things like ble bleaching preparations, insulation materials, whips. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, let's not go down that route. But, um, <laughs> But I, I, I presume that it covered those because, you know, it was uh, they, they, their terms that form part of the class headings. And, you know, historically, people used to file for um, the, the class headings and then you were deemed to cover everything in that class. So I presume it's a legacy from that and they've just never deleted those items. So Sky um, brought proceedings for infringement against a company called Skykick um, in relation to its use of the term Skykick um, uh, for cloud email migration, and cloud-based backup services. And in response to that claim for infringement, Skykick counterclaimed that Sky's registrations were invalid for bad faith. And it did that because it said that Sky didn't have an intention to use its trademarks across all items within its specification. It said that ought to constitute bad faith. So it said for things like bleaching preparation, preparations, insulation materials, and so on, Sky doesn't have an intention to use those at all. But it went a bit further than that, and this is the kind of key bit of the case. It also said that Sky is covering items like computer software, which are incredibly broad. And Sky only has an intention to use its Sky marks on, the, on, on one or two items of computer software, not the full width of computer software. Right? That's qu arguably quite a broad category, computer software. You can have computer game software, security software, all types of software. So it said that it's actually um, there's bad faith because Sky doesn't have an intention to use across a significant number of items of computer software. And then it threw in this Section 32.3 uh, argument, which is it's something peculiar to the UK, which is that um, when you file an application in the UK, you have to tick the box to say you've got a genuine intention to use the mark. And that's, as I say, peculiar to the UK, and it said that that also needs to be put in the mix when you're considering, it. is there bad faith here? Um, Skykick argued that um, if there's bad faith in relation to one item in the specification, the whole registration should fail. You should lose the whole, whole uh, registration. And if it was wrong on that, then it should at least just be partially invalidated for those items filed in bad faith. So that's uh, kind of the questions that were, were raised. And, and that was kind of really important because I think, um, you know, most of... Uh, a number of uh, registrations on the register, they, they all cover broad terms, right? We're, you know, we're all used to filing for pharmaceuticals, financial services, telecoms, all arguably quite broad terms. So this is going to impact a number of trademarks on the register. And, and not only that, you know, lots of people file for speculative items in, the, in their specification where they're not quite sure how the brand is going to develop. So this was a, a big issue. I think particularly the issue is that um, 
if there is bad faith, and we're going to get on to the decision in a moment in these scenarios, it just gives defendants to trademark claims another ground on which to attack you if you're trying to assert your brand against them, right? They're going to say, well, hold on, you're asserting a broad term here. <clears throat> That's invalid for, for, for bad faith. Now, we're um, all used to looking at questions of intention to use and use in the context of revocation actions, but that's, you know, you get five years then. What this is potentially introducing is the idea that even before the five-year period, you can attack for lack of an intention to use. So quite a new ground of attack potentially for defendants. So that's why it's um, garnered a lot of attention uh, in, the, in the legal press. So before we go on to discuss what each of the decisions said, and they do kind of build on each other, so it is necessary to kind of go back to the um, earlier decisions in order to understand the later ones. We just wanted to give you a bit of a heads up, because I think it's always good to remind ourselves where we've got to before we kind of dig down. So there have been a number of domestic decisions. I've put four here, but I think there might actually have been five domestic decisions, plus a pre-Brexit ECJ preliminary ruling, which came as a result of uh, questions referred from the UK High Court. Um, so we got the ECJ preliminary ruling. That said that, yes, there can be bad faith for lack of intention to use in certain circumstances. We'll look at that in a moment. It then came back to the High Court to apply that ruling. And this was the decision, the High Court decision, that garnered a lot of attention. So it wasn't particularly favourable to brand owners. Um, and Sky found that its registrations were substantially cut back. The court said there was ba bad faith in relation to things like computer software. Um, and that, as I say, that was where a lot of the legal writing is, is focused on. However, we've then, earlier this year, had the Court of Appeal decision, which is much more favourable to brand owners. Uh, and Magdalena is going to talk about that decision in a moment. But what that decision basically said was that an applicant isn't required to have an intention to use its mark on every conceivable subdivision of a broad category. An intention to use, I've put ITU here, that's, that's its intention to use, intention to use on some and potentially even only one item within a broad category can justify inclusion of the broad term. So you intend to use on one item of software, you can include uh, computer software in general. So this is kind of good news. It doesn't mean that bad faith has gone away. We'll come on later to say what we think all this means for you. It doesn't mean it's completely gone away, but it's not the big issue that we thought it was going to be after the High Court decision. I say good news if it's upheld because Skykick has applied for permission to appeal the decision to the Supreme Court. Um, that uh, request has not been decided yet, as far as we're aware, our, our knowledge suggests. Um, but it's possible it could go to the Supreme Court, so this might not be the last um, we've heard on this case. So very, very quickly before handing over to Magdalena, um, I'll quickly recap the ECJ decision and the High Court decision. So ECJ said, yes, there can be bad faith if, um, where there's no intention to use, if the applicant had the intention either of undermining in a manner inconsistent with honest practices the interests of third parties, so you're trying to target a third party, trying to do a defensive registration of some kind, trademark squat, that kind of thing. Or if the applicant had the intention of obtaining, even without targeting a specific third party, an exclusive right for purposes other than those falling within the functions of a trademark, but of a mouthful. So you're generally trying to get a trademark for purposes that are not kind of legitimate, not the kind of thing we're used to seeing, like advertising and um, the origin functions, etc. Um, the ECJ also said that this Section 32.3 declaration of use in the UK is fine, it's not incompatible with EU law, but it doesn't necessarily add anything here. There would be um, bad faith in other countries across the EU, even if they don't have that declaration. And then the good bits of the ECJ decision. So that, that, that was all kind of, um, I think, a, a fairly clear and good decision. I think we can all say that's probably, probably fair. Um, but leaves a bit of room for the national courts, obviously, to apply it. Um, and the sweeteners that the ECJ gave to us were that, firstly, there's no presumption of bad faith, simply because the applicant doesn't have economic activity corresponding to the goods and services applied for. So just because you're not acting in that area at the time you file the application doesn't mean there's bad faith. There's no presumption. You, they recognise the fact that your brand can change and develop over time. 
And then probably more importantly, the ECJ said, um, the whole registration doesn't fall if there's bad faith. Right? You only lose those goods and services for which bad faith is, is proved, or, or those goods and services get cut back. So that was quite a relief, I think, to, to brand owners. And then, as I say, that was applied by the High Court in a, in a fairly kind of way that was really not that helpful to brand owners. They said that a number of sky marks had been applied for in bad faith. There was no prospect of using um, the marks on certain items. There was no commercial justification for Sky having covered certain items. And it said that Sky had made a false declaration of use under Section 32.3. So what all that meant was uh, that Sky lost its um, registration to the extent it covered things like bleaching preparations, insulation materials, whips. I'm sure they were devastated at that. <laughs> um, but more importantly, that term computer software was limited. So um, it was limited to what was fair and reasonable given what Sky did have an intention to use it on. So I think it was things like computer software supplied as part of or in connection with TV and telecoms operators and services. So still a fairly broad spec, but not quite what Sky presumably wanted. Uh, in this case, it didn't change the outcome. Skykick still infringed, but obviously in other appropriate cases, that might not be so. Um, so we were left in this position. And then I'm going to hand over now to, to Magdalena, who's going to tell you the, the better news for brand owners um, arising from the Court of Appeal decision. Thank you, Louise. I'm getting a glass of water because I'm going to be talking for a long time now. <laughs> Uh, I thought it would be interesting to have a drinking game when you have a sh do a shot every time we say sky or bad faith, <laughs> but you might end up quite drunk at the end of this. Um, so, um, like as Louise mentioned, uh, I will now cover the Court of Appeal uh, decision. I'll try to do it fairly quickly because I think I know that we're running quite short for time. Um, so both parties appealed, however, only Sky's uh, appeal was allowed. Uh, and that was only in relation to uh, the partial invalidity with regard to the broader terms, including computer software. Um, as Louise mentioned, Sky was successful with regard to that term, uh, which was um, held not to be applied in bad faith. Um, this is because applicant is not required to have an intent to use uh, of its mark on every conceivable sub subdivision of a broad category. Um, and on this, at, the same, at the same time, intention to use the trademark on just some of them, perhaps even one within such a broad category, uh, could justify inclusion of the, of the entire broad term. Um, we've, Louise referred briefly to the Section 32, Subsection 3 of the UK Trademarks Act, uh, which is quite of a quirk of the UK system. Um, and perhaps when any of you file trademark applications still, or have the paralegals do it, um, the tick box at the end appears at the end of the application, where trademark owner has to declare that either he uses the trademark or intends to use it. Um, the Court of Appeal judgment here stated that this statement should be interpreted narrowly. Um, and that the requirement does not apply to all possible types of goods and services within the category because that would be too burdensome for trademark owners. Um, with regard to detailed reasoning, um, there was two grounds on which the High Court um, issued its decision. One of them uh, was the not prospect of use. Um, that ground failed um, because the Court of Appeal found that it was implicit that Sky's applications were made, at least in part, uh, with the intention of protecting the use of the mark in relation to goods and services in which Sky had, in fact, a substantial trade uh, and a future expectation of trade. Um, on that basis, the case was d d distinguishable uh, from cases of trademark squatting, where there the sole intention and sole objective of an application is to stop third parties uh, from being able to use the trademark. Um, with regard to the other ground, um, no commercial justification for use, um, the Court of Appeal held that a trademark applicant uh, does not have to formulate a commercial strategy from the outset as to how it intends to use a trademark. Um, trademark owners should be allowed to say, I have no idea what I'm going to be doing with my trademark in the future. Right now I'm using this, this, this category, it works for me now, but I need to, own, I need to have some buffer. Um, and such an entity would not be filed in bad faith if it, if it, it was covering um, that kind of broad term. Um, does this now mean that there's no bad faith uh, if applicant has attention to use at least one item within a broad class? Well, as usual as it is, uh, it is not clear. Um, the Court of Appeal said, mind you only obiter, that an example of a small computer software marketing uh, company marketing only one type of computer software program would not be applying for the whole category of computer software in bad faith, 
but that's the only situation where that's okay. Whether it would always be the case, we don't know. It appears that perhaps that would might be different uh, depending on the facts of the case. Um, one other important point that was raised in that decision was that now, almost as a formality requirement, if an application uh, to cancel a trademark is filed on the basis of bad faith, but not to the entire breadth of the specification, the cancellation applicant should specify as to what specification the trademark should get cut down to. Uh, the reason for that is to give the trademark owner a chance to submit the evidence that would be um, only responding to the allegation rather than to everything. Now, is this decision correct? Well, <laughs> I think that everyone w might have a different opinion depending on, on which side of the fence you stand and which side you're trying to argue. Um, some obviously argue that the decision is too lenient to brand owners. Um, do we want such broad terms as computer software? I will get back to that. Uh, some argue that the decision is correct because bad faith is a serious allegation, is akin to dishonesty and should not be just thrown around nilly-willy. Um, does this mean that the risk of bad faith counterattacks is now reduced? Perhaps, because on paper you should only succeed uh, in the case of trademark squatting or no prospects of use. However, it is probably likely that third parties will still be using this as a tactic um, to kind of make life more difficult for trademark owners. Um, what strategy should trademark owners take as a result of this decision? Well, as it always has been the case, uh, trademark owners should be careful when applying for items or broad categories when there is no prospect of use at all. Um, and they should also continue to apply for both the narrow terms and the broad terms to be on the safe side. Because at the end of the day, uh, all of the decisions kind of stated the same thing, that the, it wouldn't be that the entire registration is deleted from the system. It still stays there only to the extent that uh, and you only be um, narrowed down to the extent that the broad term was used. Therefore, applying for both probably gives um, the biggest, the best um, safety net. Now, I already teased computer software, so I'll go back to this, uh, as this is very obviously important for a lot of our clients and for a lot of businesses. Um, is this decision correct for computer software, given how broad this category is? Uh, well, Code of Appeal drew an analogy between computer software and detergents. No idea why that was chosen. <laughs> um, and in the, in the decision, uh, Code of Appeal stated that a trademark owner who only markets one type of detergent, being a household detergent, and have no intention to go into any other area of detergents, be it industrial detergents, if it applies for the whole category of detergents, it's not ask, acting in, in bad faith. My question is, is uh, computer software the same as detergents? Um, I mean, the, the, there was a decision, uh, a recent decision from General Court in the Zoom case when it was specifically referred to that in today's society, basically every device that we use, every digital electronic equipment, everything has some kind of software in it. But when you go to work, you have to use your pass to get in, you have to use your phone to pay, you have to you listen to your music on a different app. There's different software that's saving your life. There's different software used for um, defense uh, systems, etc. So again, perhaps now applying for computer software is basically like, like applying for things, because it could be anything. Well, that question remains, so I'll leave you with that. <laughs> um, and I'll move to another case uh, that everyone uh, is referring to as Monopoly, um, that uh, covers the important question of refiling and evergreening. Um, so I'll start with something more colourful, a bit more interesting. <laughs> um, I don't know if you've heard about the game Drinkopoly. Uh, it's a drinking game uh, <laughs> that I actually had the chance to look at very briefly. Apparently, the more you progress in the game, the more rude the tasks in the game get. And one of the cards that I saw sold the, portrayed the man and woman in a more compromising position. <laughs> so I was going to make a joke that maybe, if, you know, that maybe you could play afterwards, but no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Um, you will see why, obviously, Hasbro having its Monopoly game, which is also very wholesome, had a problem with that game. Uh, but we're not going to be talking about that. Um, I will now cover the fact that uh, Drinkopoly, uh, which is marketed by a Croatian company that the name I cannot pronounce, um, filed an application for Drinkopoly back in 2010. This is how long this has been going on for. Um, and actually, I'll leave the, the images for a little bit longer. Um, uh, this application was then opposed by Hasbro, uh, who owns the registration for the wordmark Monopoly. Uh, what's interesting, this registration, the application for Monopoly was filed about, I think it was 12 days before the Drinkopoly application. And that's 2010. Obviously, Monopoly has been around for much longer. <laughs> We're not all that old. <laughs> um, so uh, 
why was that? Well, it's because Hasbro has been filing registration applications for Monopoly repeatedly, covering games and toys and similar goods and services. Uh, the earliest one was actually filed in 1996, was registered in 1998, and the mark that was relied on was uh, filed in 2010. So between the 98 and 2010, there were actually four applications. They were all refiled at different um, times, so it was they were not always every five years, but they were kind of the interfering periods. Um, so when the application, when the opposition was filed against the Drinkopoly mark, uh, it was only relied on the non-vulnerable new application. Um, as such, the owner of Drinkopoly could not then request proof of use. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about this. I mean, you, most of you probably know that the main pain for trademark owners is trying to prove use, it's especially so if um, the specification covers a long range of a long list of trademark of, of goods and services. And I think it's especially difficult for uh, trademark owners who actually the, the main product is a service. Um, and it's even more so at the EU IPO and it's not just one country that we need to cover, it's a whole breadth obviously of all the EU member states. Um, so which also has become a bit of a tactic for some of the trademark owners to just simply re request proof of use, make life difficult for trademark owners. Um, as a result then the kind of common strategy has been to try to refile the applications, which I go back to that. Um, so in response to this uh, opposition, the owner of Drinkopoly, because they could not request proof of use, they could not attack the mark on this on non-use, they decided to file an application for a cancellation on the, ba on the basis of bad faith. Um, this was quite unfortunate for Hasbro. Uh, the initial decision at the cancellation division stage uh, was um, favorable for Has to Hasbro. However, at the Board of Appeal stage, things started to get dark. <laughs> um, one of the reasons might be that um, the Board of Appeal actually unusually requested that um, the representative of Hasbro should come to Alicante for an oral he hearing. They're probably all thinking, fantastic, a little trip to Alicante to Spain, it's gonna be great. <laughs> uh, but they probably weren't, were not thinking that actually what they say might be a bit dangerous. Because um, the main problem here was that what was admitted in the Board of Appeal, um, before the Board of Appeal and then carried on to General Court, uh, was that the reasoning behind the refiling for uh, the monopoly applications was the wish to extend the five-year grace period to avoid the need to constantly produce the, ev the evidence of use. Um, and for that reason, that was the most fatal to Hasbro, actually. Um, and even though there might be other legitimate reasons for refiling, this is kind of like a kiss of death, that's it. So in this case, the factors that were particularly fatal to Hasbro, and I think Louise mentioned this, the problem about faith is that there was no definition, there is no strict criteria, it could be different in every case. And it's not that in one case it was four factors that kind of moved the, towards bad faith, meaning that it would be exact, exactly identical in another case, because there might be something different. So this is just a list of what didn't work out for Hasbro. So as I mentioned before, Hasbro mentioned the reduction of administrative burden of proven use. Uh, they also, the fact that they relied on, this, on that repeat filing um, in trying to enforce their rights, that was uh, one of the issues here. Um, also the fact that Hasbro said that it is a normal industry practice, so be careful everyone never say that, <laughs> to refile, uh, because General Code actually held that, that that actually meant that the strategy was intentional, that it wasn't that they were just refiling. Um, and finally, the fact obviously they referred that it's the, to reduce the administrative burden, however, all of the early monopoly marks were not surrendered, so they were con continuously renewed, so more fees, if anything, were being incurred. Uh, What's important here, before you all start panicking, <laughs> mere refiling on its, on its own of overlapping mark does not of itself constitute bad faith. Um, now there are some um, factors raised by Hasbro that in their defense to kind of explain, like, fine, yes, we tried to obviously to avoid the need to, to prove, to have to produce all that evidence, but there were also other reasons why we did uh, refile those applications. So one of them obviously being that um, there's often that the line of products is expanding, so we need to cover more. Uh, there are some license arrangements. Um, so for that reason, of, of course, there is a reason why you'll be filing. However, if in the application that you've refiled, you still covered the original terms, you're trying to prolong the five-year grace period, it's not gonna help you. Um, the fact that the subsequent EUTM was broader, again, that wasn't of help because, again, as we mentioned, the mark would only be invalid to the extent that the goods were still covered by the new application, that were, to the extent of the same goods being covered. Um, the fact that the use of monopoly could have easily been proved, again, that was irrelevant because what mattered was the intention at the time of filing uh, that refiled um, application. 
The fact that refiling was not close to the end of the five-year grace period, again, that was irrelevant. Um, as long as you're trying to extend the, the grace period, it doesn't matter whether it's a year or two. Um, conventional refiling is a common practice and Hasbro acted in accordance with uh, advice from council. Uh, just because others are doing it doesn't mean that it's legal um, or acceptable, and you should know that. Uh, <laughs> I think it sounds like something that, 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 that your mother would say, probably. But um, And finally, they also raised that cancellation division would be swamped with bad faith cases if that was the line that they followed. Again, uh, the Court of Appeal has, so the General Court um, held that there was no evidence for that. So again, that wasn't good enough. So what does it mean for us? And did monopoly end monopoly for everyone? Sorry, I was waiting to say this. <laughs> um, well, first of all, obviously, there's a question of Brexit. The general court decision was issued after the exit date. Uh, so in theory, or legally, it's not binding on UK, but um, it's likely that, that this um, decision would be followed on similar facts. Uh, will other litigants ever make a similar admission about reducing the, the burden? Probably not unless they're not advised by us. <laughs> um, um, and as for the, for the refiling strategy, it's important to have good commercial reasons. Uh, so expanding goods and services, not, not just to avoid proven use, but it's because there is something new that's been released because we have a new arrangement, um, et cetera. This is kind of everything that needs to be kind of kept in mind now. Um, with regard to the enforcement strategy, again, what we have to think about not automatically relying on the mark that's not vulnerable just because it's going to be easy because there is a risk of the bad faith attack. Uh, if you do have to rely on the refiled mark, probably have to think about the fact that it, th there may be a bad faith allegation to be faced. So again, that, must be some that might be something that you want to factor in. Um, maybe prep your representatives never, never to say anything incriminating. <laughs> uh, and of course, on the flip side, consider the possibility of raising bad faith someone else is trying to attack you. Um, that could be helpful. But as always mentioned, uh, there is potentially an appeal to uh, ECJ by Hasbro, so everything might change. Okay, that's it for me. I believe in drink. <laughs> Thank you. So, very, very quickly in the last minute, just pulling that together, just pointing out a few other recent bad faith cases that if you're you know, wanting to know more or having to uh, think about this for your business, then these are good cases to look at. The first three all involve this idea of intention to use um, and so that they're quite quite interesting but I won't go into the facts now and, and then the Swatch case is a slightly different uh, form of bad faith which is about whether it's bad faith if you parody or poke fun at a competitor by filing a trademark application for something that they are known for um, so they're well worth looking at so to to bring all that together with our conclusions I think um, certainly be careful what you say and what you document about why you're refiling or what goods and services you're covering, but also the flip side, do document the good legitimate commercial reasons why you're filing your trademarks covering certain goods and services or why you're refiling. Um, be careful including items if you've got no prospect of use at all. I think that goes without saying. Um, include specific as well as broad terms. So if, if possible, you can rely on just the specific terms when you enforce against third parties, then you potentially don't have to think so much about bad faith, bad faith counterclaims. Um, and, and also that's useful for uh, limiting what proof of use you have to uh, supply as well potentially down the line. Um, take care when enforcing, just be aware that um, defendants might uh, be raising bad faith arguments against you, um, especially if you've got kind of no use at all yet in relation to the, to the item you're trying to enforce, um, the, the goods or services you're trying to assert against a third party. Um, consider the possibility of raising bad faith yourself, obviously, um, because then it can, it can help muddy the water for you in appropriate cases if you have a, a claim in. And, and watch for appeals because uh, both of these cases are uh, permission to appeal has been requested. So uh, they're not going to go away and I, I don't think bad faith is going to go away as well. I think we can expect uh, more litigants arguing that there's bad faith in a much broader variety of circumstances going forwards.